the lost books of the Bible. Is that what we're really talking about today on Time Suck? Yeah. Was I super excited to dive into this topic when I found out that our Space Lizard listeners voted it in on the app? Uh, no, I wasn't. Full disclosure, I voted for the Green River Killer on the app. I mean, we just did an episode last week with a strong Christian theme, and now we're doing another? Well, kind of. Turns out, once again, the wisdom of the Space Lizard community has surpassed my own. Turns out this is a great topic, a fascinating topic, a very hard topic to research. You guys kicked my ass on this one, uh, this on the week back from vacation, but a highly relevant and perpetually relevant topic. And last week's episode, the Westboro Baptist Church Suck, was not really a Christian episode. I'm not Christian myself, but I know a lot of Christians who do not want, in any way, shape, or form, to be associated with the subject of last week's episode. A lot of wonderful Christians wrote in, and they were uh, more pissed off than anyone about those wackadoodles. This week is way interesting. It's deep. We take a pre-Catholic, pre-Great Protestant divide look into the very formation of Christianity itself. Still sound boring? Well, clearly, you're not familiar with a lot of the Bible stories. There is so much intense shit in there. Magic battles, demon fights, demon fights, weird, entertaining, archaic customs and rules, big, badass, bloodthirsty archangels, cities leveled to the ground by an angry, all-powerful God, betrayal, forgiveness, more betrayal, more forgiveness, lots of fire-breathing dragons. Okay, maybe, maybe not a lot of dragons. I think there is a few dragons referenced in the lost, uh, lost books of the Bible, though. But there are uh, they're definitely giants. The Christian God and the God of ancient Judaism, far from boring uh, of a deity. But maybe you think, yeah, but I'm not Christian. How does this uh, relate to me? Or I was raised in the church, and honestly, I've heard enough about all this growing up. Or I'm Christian, and I get this every Sunday, and I'm not interested in having my religion possibly slandered. Well, none of those excuses work today, okay? First, this topic relates to and is relevant to all of us. Because by and large, if you live in an English-speaking nation, or even a nation where a large portion of the population can also speak English, you probably live in a culture greatly influenced and or created you know, by Christianity. And if you live in a predominantly Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, or, or country of another religion, odds are you're all too familiar with Christian nations messing around in some way or, or another with your culture, whether through warfare, missionary work, both. The colonization of the Americans, the South Pacific, Africa, even parts of Asia, all greatly influenced by European Christianity. No religion has shaped the cultures of the modern world more than Christianity. It's not even close. It's a largely Christian world. The world has more Christians than it does members of any other major religion. Over 2 billion. There are over 1.6 billion Muslims and just over 1 billion Hindus, but Muslim and Hindu nations just haven't influenced modern international culture in quite the same way that American and European Christianity have. The U.S. has been the largest exporter of culture in the world since the 1960s at least. And the culture we spread, the music, film, TV, fashion, podcasts, is all rooted or shaped by Christianity. The U.S. was founded by very religious, very Christian people, and we still feel the effects of their influence today, heavily. Over 76% of United States citizens still identify as being at least somewhat religious, and over 70% of U.S. citizens identify with some form of Christianity. It is by far the dominant religion. To answer the question once posed by Time magazine, God is not dead. The United States is still a very religious nation. And what is this dominant religion based on? The Bible. Obvious, right? As a Lutheran or Calvinist or Catholic or Greek Orthodox, Jehovah's Witness, Branch Davidian, and yes, other Christians, the Branch Davidians do identify as Christian. While you may disagree greatly over the interpretation of the Bible, you at least agree that the Bible is, you know, a, a pretty important textual basis for your religion, if not the only book that matters to your religion. But have you ever stopped to think about how the book your face is based on got here? Like, how was it written? Who wrote it? When? I mean, it's not like one day uh, the Christian Savior, prophet, and son of God, Jesus, died, and the next day some antiquity version of, of paper boys just showed up on the street corners of Jerusalem. Just, get your Bible. Get your fresh Bible. Hot off the presses. New religion in town. Get your salvation. Two shekels for salvation. No, it took a while. It took a while during an era when people weren't real good at writing shit down. Staples and Office Depot hadn't quite made it to the Middle East 2,000 years ago. Literacy rates weren't exactly over 90% in most of the world like they are now. And 2,000 years ago, just like today, human beings weren't real good at agreeing on shit. In the first few centuries of life after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the earliest of his followers, the earliest Christians, formed various little groups within their predominantly Jewish communities, and they documented to the best of their abilities, or in some cases, to the best of their ability to suit someone else's uh, messages to their very own, very human agenda, 
to explain the life and messages of Jesus and his disciples. And over time, these various recollections and stories and parables and lessons, etc., morphed into the Bible you hold today. And even today, there are several variations of that Bible. So let's take a gander at the formation of arguably the most influential book in the history of the world, the God of Christianity's perennial bestseller, and then look into some initial rough draft chapters that didn't, didn't quite make the final cut today on Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Happy Monday, time suckers. I'm Dan Cummins, a.k.a. the Master Sucker, a.k.a. the Suck Puppet, Prophet of Nimrod, fourth leg of Bojangles, the proclaimer of Michael motherfucking McDonald, and the occasional harbinger of Lucifina. And you, fair member of the Cult of the Curious, are listening to Time Suck. And you're a beautiful fucking person inside and out, and if anyone tells you different, you kick them right in their vagina dick. Yep. And today's Time Suck is brought to you by American Addiction Centers. Addiction is a very serious nationwide problem, and there's no easy fix And recovery is not one size fits all. Just like certain baseball hats that claim they are, but comically perch on my top of my giant brain holster instead of actually fitting on my head. American Addiction Centers customize their treatment to fit individual needs with evidence-based practices and specialized patient care technology. This is especially important in the midst of the current opioid epidemic, a problem too many of us are all too familiar with. So time suckers, if you're ready to get help, Call American Addiction Centers at 888-708-4264. That's 888-708-4264. Available 24-7. Your life is worth more than your addiction. Don't wait until it's too late, and that's no joke. Hail Nimrod. Take care of yourselves, time suckers. You meat sacks are the most beautiful souls I've come across in 40 years of hoofing around this big old space rock. The world needs you to stick around. You're the best. Treat yourself accordingly. For those of you not struggling with addiction, those of you who, uh, you know, if you don't like to partake of marijuana, you enjoy listening to the lifestyle, you will enjoy our next sponsor. Time Suck is also brought to us by My West Coast Buds Podcast. Hosted by comic, time sucker, weed wizard, Joe DeMeo, My West Coast Buds is an inside baseball look at cannabis, coffee, comedy, and spirits, all of Joe's favorite vices. It's a funny conversation with he and his co-host where you learn a lot about the explosive new industry of legal marijuana, and they have great guests. And this week's episode, also released today, features Chino Lee, voted one of Portland, Oregon's top bartenders and all-around badass dude. And that's some, saying something in Portland, because, man, that town doesn't mess around with mixology. He gives the guys drinking tips, tells kick-ass inside stories about the restaurant industry, tells some bar stories, gives his take on why kitchens are bastions for crazy and creative people. The guys will also have a bonus 420 episode this Friday, just like Time Suck, where they will talk to comedian Todd Armstrong. So check that out as well. Uh, In addition to cannabis, coffee, comedy, and spirits, my West Coast buds, uh, you get an inside look at all sorts of other industries and topics. So listen, subscribe to my West Coast buds podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, all sorts of other podcast players, including, of course, mywestcoastbuds.com. Right, great website. Check it out. Link in today's episode description. You can also find them in the sponsor section of the Time Suck app. Just push their button and get right to them. All right, some quick suck announcements now. All right, uh, and if you hear a little recording difference today, uh, I am I am not recording from the Suck Dungeon. I was on vacation for a week and then went straight from that. Flew to, from New Orleans to uh, Charlotte and started an eight day, eight city tour. Uh, this is day eight of that. So I'm recording the morning of the San Antonio show. The tour has been fucking amazing, and uh, but I'm having to record in my Dallas hotel room in the morning just because I wasn't able to get that far ahead to get that many episodes uh, in the can. And actually, I couldn't because this one was a, was a voted one, a voted in topic. So, yeah, if it sounds a little different, I'm, I'm holding a microphone in a, in a Hilton Garden Inn <laughs> instead, of, uh, instead of being in the good old suck dungeon. All right, some good news. Uh, the first round of Danger Brain Design Time Suck stickers are in the shop, and uh, as are some dope-ass vinyl decals. Thanks to all you time suckers who've been scooping those up this past week and already spreading the suck. And as long as they're in stock, you get a free sticker pack with every order of more than $30. Each 4-inch by 6-inch Danger Brain Design sticker sheet contains three variations of the Time Suck logo, a Bojangle sticker, Space Lizard sticker, Nimrod sticker. Hail Nimrod! Get them, put them on your laptop, notebook, locker, wiener, bicycle, guitar case, vagina, cell phone cover, mom's fine china, rare painting, nipple, desk, boss's computer screen, cop car, and or butthole. You and only you decide where you stick to suck. Uh, the six-inch-long Danger Brain Design vinyl decals are perfect for your car, 
come in three colors and two different designs. So many sucking choices. How do you let other time suckers know a sucker is behind the wheel or that your whole damn family sucks or that no one sucks harder and deeper and for longer than you do? By getting this decal and sticking it uh, on your window and or your face. All right. Huge thanks to all the time suckers who came out to the shows this past week, man. I got got to take a second to do that. Truly, uh, some of the best crowds I performed in front of in my whole life. Holy shit. This thing is revving up. Uh, I met so many wonderful time suckers and space lizards in Charlotte, Atlanta, Birmingham, Huntsville, Nashville, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio. And whether the crowd was, you know, sold out 500 people in a little theater or, or, or 100 people in Huntsville, it was a great group that really wanted to be there. Definitely coming back to the South. Man, uh, the suck is just getting stronger. You, you guys wore shirt, shirts, hoodies, hats. You brought gifts, art, food, an action figure, little Bojangles doghouse. Most, most importantly, you brought your wonderful souls to those shows, and together we made it the best time. Uh, you're too good to me, and, and I can't wait to uh, figure out how to bring more live Time Suck podcasts uh, to a lot of the country. More stand-up shows coming up quick. The Flat Earth Tour continues. Uh, Salt Lake City this weekend. The new Jordan Landing Wise Guys is Friday and Saturday, April 20 and 21st. Four shows. Uh, some of those are almost sold out, so get your ticks. San Francisco punchline next week. Sacramento and Phoenix up after that. Live Time Suck podcast in Spokane on May 6th. That's a Sunday. More tour dates at dancummins.tv. Time Suck 83, Lost Books of the Bible, right now. All right, so before we delve into the last books of the Bible, we need to understand what books are already in the Bible. A book that, is, uh, as of October 2017, had been translated into 670 languages. I wonder, I wonder if one of those was uh, is Pig Latin. Ude unto hey, others hey, as hey, you hey. Ude way, av hey, unde, unto hey, you hey. That's the, that's the golden rule, Pig Latin, if you didn't catch that. Uh, I don't think it's been translated into Pig Latin, but it, maybe it should be. Well, the most popular version of the Bible in the world today is the King James version of the Bible. It's a little more popular than the Prince Jimmy Bible and a lot more popular than the Duke uh, Jimbo Bible. And hopefully, you know, I made those last two versions uh, up entirely. That came out of my head. The commissioning of the King James Bible took place in 1604 at the Hampton Court Conference outside of London, England. Uh, The first edition appeared in 1611. The translation was done by 47 scholars, all of whom were members of the Church of England, and none of whom were probably very fun at parties. Uh, King James gave the translators instructions intended to ensure that the new version would conform to the ecclesiology and reflect the Episcopal structure of the Church of England and its belief in an ordained clergy. It is important to note that uh, none of the biblical translations in medieval and ancient Europe or really just anywhere, were done under the direction of, hey, uh, uh, you scholars, uh, just translate it and just reorganize it with 100% accuracy. Uh, I care not if some of the words within those ancient bindings reflect poorly upon the manner in which I govern the population of my nation. I only want the true word of God reflected. Consequences be damned. Uh, no. Uh, I'm sure they were more like, hey, uh, I-, I want you to update the holiest of books, and I want you to, to accurately capture the true word of God. But uh, here's the thing. I need God's words to line up with the way we're running shit. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I don't want a social uprising, neither does God. So uh, easy on the verses where God encourages his people to rise up against their worldly masters and and heavy on the turn the other cheek stuff. Heavy on the meek shall inherit the earth stuff. Uh, Because, you know, if if it doesn't come out to my liking, I'm going to label you a heretic and I'm going to have you tortured and killed. (laughs) Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. So have fun. Get back to translating there, Friar. I've got my eye on you. And when you're working for King James, uh, like when you're working for most medieval monarchs, y- you needed to do what you wa- he wanted uh, if you wanted to keep your head. He-, he really wasn't fucking around. King James was known to torture and kill those he deemed unholy, and I imagine if he didn't like you, there was a good chance you would be labeled unholy. You know, just, uh, Joffrey, what do you think of Stephen? I don't like the way he's constantly batting his way into conversations at the ball tonight, and a lot of women here seem to fancy him a bit more than they seem to fancy me. He seems a bit... Uh unholy, does he not? Yeah, uh, King James was especially big on witches. He personally oversaw numerous cases of women being labeled witches and their subsequent torture and execution. Uh, When he was but a prince, he actually wrote and published a book called Demonology in 1597. It was a book about a demon named Malazak who Welsh witches conjured into existence in 1595. And this demon went on to eat several missing British children and the witches who lived in Corinth pretended uh, to be illiterate housemaids of uh, Duke Wilfred Roberts IV, a prominent shipyard banker. And one day, Wilfred's third daughter, 15-year-old Elizabeth III, disappeared in the middle of the night 
And when Georgina the second, the child's nanny, told him she was gone, Wilford the fourth noticed she smiled in a funny way, kind of like the way like a devil witch would smile. So he had her stretched upon the rack until she told him where his daughter was, and she refused. You know, she pretended that she had no idea, convenient. She would stretch until she tore into four somewhat equal pieces. And then when the other women who worked in his home got super sad about the whole being tortured and killed thing, he knew they were clearly agents of Malazak. Ha <laughs> ha, gotcha. And he had them burned alive. And then he burned everyone who cried about them, Burned. Uh, he had them burned alive. And then he burned a few other people alive who didn't clap hard enough for the second group of people being burned alive. And then he had several other women from town, uh, obvious witches, who made themselves known by either looking at him for too long or not for long enough or not at all. He had them set on fire. And then while they're on fire, he had them catapulted into the sea. And then he had the sea itself burned alive. And, and you probably realize by now that this tale has gotten uh, way too convoluted and nonsensical, uh, even for 16th century England. How, how long did you believe that one? At which point did you realize I was jerking your brain chain? I, I hope you made it all the way to women being catapulted while on fire into the sea before you were like, wait a minute. No, that's, what, that's not what demonology was about at all. But it does kind of seem like the sort of thing that could have uh, happened at the time, which I feel like says a lot about the era. Now, in 1597, Prince James, later King James of England, did write Demonology, a philosophical dissertation on contemporary necromancy. I'm not kidding this time. And the historical relationships between the various methods of divination used from ancient black magic. This included a study on demonology and the methods demons used to bother troubled men while touching on topics such as werewolves and vampires. Seriously, I'm kidding. Uh, for real, he wrote this stuff in, in a not being a uh, uh, silly or ironic way. Uh, this shit is really what he was writing about. Black magic, werewolves, vampires. And this is the guy who would oversee the translation that would become the King James Version. Uh, he break down specific topics in his book, such as the devil's contract with man, comparisons between the miracles of God and the devil, the path of a sorcerer's apprenticeship, the appearance of devils, the times and forms which they appear, and methods of transportation and the illusions of Satan. This is a real book. That people would read to acquire knowledge about the spiritual world. Just, uh, oh, so, oh, so that's how the devil gets around. Oh, <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Oh, I thought that was how one became a sorcerer's apprentice. Here's a little excerpt from this book, a little snippet from the second book. It was divided into three. First chapter. But I pray you before ye go further, let me interrupt you here with a short digression, which is that many can scarcely believe that there is such a thing as witchcraft, whose reasons I will shortly allege uh, unto you, uh, that ye may satisfy me as well in that as ye have done in the rest. For first, whereas the scripture seems uh, to pronounce witch witchcraft to be by diverse examples, and especially by sundry of the same, which ye hath alleged, it is thought by some that these places uh, speak of of magicians and necromancers only, and not of witches. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's that's really what he wrote. And uh, necromancers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, important to understand the headspace, I think, of the guy who oversaw the most popular edition of the most popular book of all time. I'm teasing him a bit, but the King James Version of the Bible was truly revolutionary because prior to this translation, the Bible was not widely available to be read in English or any other language that was not Latin in medieval Europe. There were a few English versions, though, uh, before it, versions read primarily by clergy and scholars, virgins, uh, virgins such as the one that Shakespeare, uh, I've heard of him, uh, was familiar with, the Geneva Bible, which was printed for the first time in 1560. Prior to this was the Great Bible, authorized by King Henry VIII and uh, published in 1539. That was, first authorized, uh, that was the first authorized English Bible. It was used to be read aloud at church services for the Church of England after Henry VIII gave the Pope the proverbial middle finger and split from Rome when they wouldn't let him get yet another new wife. Uh, we, we've talked about that. Uh, prior to the Anglican Church the prior, uh, and prior to the 16th century Protestant Reformation, Christian scripture was officially only read in Latin. And again, we did talk about a lot of that before in Time Sucks 74, the IRA. Uh, the scene of the worst Irish accent in fucking human history about this uh, split that led uh, to many, many years later the formation of the Irish Republican Army when Ireland, uh, who did not culturally split from Rome, became subjugated in various ways under the thumbs of English Protestants. Okay, so prior to the Great Bible, uh, both partial and whole English translations of the Bible uh, existed as far back as the 7th century, but they were private copies never widely circulated. Some random monk, you know, he would copy over a few verses, some royal scholar could copy a few things there, and, and by and large, when they were caught doing this, their genitals were, were cut off and they were forced to live in the forest. Uh, prior to being translated out of Latin, for centuries the Bible was available in Latin only. 
uh, outside of a few scholars, you know, to the clergy of the Catholic Church who would give uh, mass in Latin, which is interesting because many medieval peasants didn't have a real good grasp of Latin. So they would literally just sit through a sermon they didn't understand. The priest would speak of God in their native tongue, uh, you know, though as well, but not, not for the formal mass. You know, and he would just kind of give them the gist of the main messages, uh, like the Ten Commandments, you know, believe in Jesus, go to heaven, be sure to tithe to the church, don't do anything naughty or question, this, or question uh, the spiritual supremacy of the Catholic Church, or the devil will torture you forever and ever in hell. Uh, oh, oh, and before I forget, I was kidding about scholars getting their genitals chopped off and being translated and being forced to live in the woods. Again, though, it does feel possible, right, for the era. I wouldn't be surprised if that did actually happen. Uh, you ever see the stained glass windows of a Catholic church? I went to a beautiful one in New Orleans when I was on vacation last week, and I went to the Immaculate Conception. It's a Jesuit Catholic church just, just outside the French Quarter at 130 Barone Street, and, and can't recommend it enough. It looks nice from the outside, but not, like, amazing. Breathtaking on the inside. It was, it was designed in this neo-Venetian Gothic style of the Gothic Revival architecture. It has this enormous nave. It's, it's got to be, like, 100 to 150 feet from floor to ceiling. Uh, there's several levels of, uh, levels of beautiful stained glass windows of, of some biblical scenes. Jesus with his disciples, Jesus with Mother Mary, Jesus on the cross, etc. And the priest there that day, I talked to him for about 20, 30 minutes. Uh, you know, he told me that when viewed from left to right, each row of windows told a story from the Bible. Some, you know, some very expensive old kind of Sunday morning Christian comic strip, you know, or, or a graphic novel of sorts. Because a lot of the poor, they couldn't understand what the priest was saying because they didn't speak Latin. And, and so they just kind of, they used the windows in a lot of Catholic churches just to kind of reinforce the main themes and main stories of the Bible. And why didn't they read the Bible in other languages for so many years? Well, because they didn't want the general public to have direct access to the Word of God. To find salvation, you had to go through the Catholic Church. It's a fucking brilliant business move. I mean, they had the entire market on European souls just cornered for centuries. I mean, classic supply and demand economics. They had the most important product in the world, your salvation, uh, access to heaven, and they were not interested in competition or, or, or letting you just kind of, you know, it, it's like what it reminds me of the old times like on Scientology when like uh, uh, Dine, or L. Ron Hubbard first uh, created this Dianetic system and let people audit themselves. And then it was like, oh, shit, everybody just bought my auditing equipment and now they're just off on their own doing it and they don't need me anymore. And when he came back around for the next version, he's like, no, 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 we, we got to do it. We do it. Uh, authorized people need to do it. And then you get to perpetually make money. Anyway, so now we know that, uh, that the King, of J King James of England, 1604, commissioned a bunch of scholars to translate the Latin Bible of the Catholic Church into the English Bible, still very much in use today, made the Word of God more accessible for, uh, for Christians. And then there are other popular English Bible versions, uh, such as the NIV, the New International Version. The NIV began in 1956 with the formation of a small committee to study the value of producing a translation in the common language of the American people. The project was formally started after a meeting in 1965 at Trinity Christian College in Palos Heights, Illinois, of uh, the Christian Reformed Church, National Association of Evangelicals, and a group of international scholars. First published in 1978 by Biblica, uh, used to be International Bible Society. And there's many other versions. And for each version, the oldest text available to scholars at the time are consulted to help ensure accuracy. Uh, modern Bibles are, are not actually just copies of a copy of a copy, uh, etc. When a new version is created, scholars go to the earliest surviving sources and reconstruct them, which is different than I previously thought. For whatever reasons, I thought that the, that the King James, for example, was just translated from Latin to English. I feel like a lot of people think that, I just based on conversations I've had over my life. I feel like a lot, a lot of people think that like, oh, okay, so they have this one Bible in Latin, and then they just try to copy Latin into English. And that's that's actually not true. They when they come up with new editions, uh, scholars go back to the uh, the earliest documents we have surviving uh, from the Bible, uh, you know, written in like Greek, Hebrew, uh, Aramaic, and and, and retranslate it from the original sources using modern kind of other Bibles as you know secondary sources. However, I, you know, even though they do that, I do think it gets harder and harder to ensure cultural uh, kind of accuracy as time goes on with each new version because the meanings of words change. Right, we've talked about that many times here on The Suck. Uh, and, and since we don't know much about the lives of the original authors, you know, it gets harder and harder to truly understand their culture, I feel like, and, and determine as, as time goes on, you know, in terms of what they're trying to say. It's not like we have a lot of video from the old days, you know. Uh, like, like, think about the word love. Think about how many different meanings it has. Like, when you love your neighbor, uh, I'm guessing you're not making love to your neighbor. Uh, if you are, man, fucking sweet neighborhood you got. Uh... Maybe maybe you maybe you're in a cult. Sounds like a pretty cool place to live. Uh, the love you feel for your kid, uh, you know, probably different than the love you feel for your grandma or mom or wife or boyfriend, etc. And, and the type of love we have for for the people in our lives might be expressed and even felt differently by members of different cultures. 
eras, places, right? And love isn't the only word uh, with multiple meanings. I mean, you know, the meanings of words and then even the meanings of phrases, you know, will change a lot over time. Take, for example, the phrase uh, stroking uh, soft cock of shame. You know, that phrase... <laughs> That phrase like a year ago to most people probably came across as pretty offensive, you know, slanderous uh, to those suffering from impotence. But now when you say it in a, in a shitty Rux Russian accent uh, said through a, a somehow harmless cartoon version of a real life Ukrainian serial killer, you'll stalk it in soft cocoa shame. What is the big deal? I stalk, I stalk it. How would it bother anyone? Now it's just become one of the many ways we time suckers greet each other in public, which is not weird at all. But you get the idea. It, it, you know, hard to translate an old book for a variety of reasons. And when the Bible is translated from Latin to English, it's safe to say that the meaning of some passages, you know, probably began to be interpreted differently at the very least. So, so how did the Bible end up being written in Latin anyway? And I promise we're going to get to the lost books. I think we just got to establish really for, especially for non-Christians and people not raised uh, as much around Christianity, like what the Bible is, because then it just, that's how we establish how it matters to have these uh, books not get in. Uh, so yeah, so so how did the Bible uh, end up uh, being written in Latin? Uh, is that what people spoke during during the time of, of Moses and the prophets and during the time of Jesus and the disciples? No, uh, they spoke various dialects of Hebrew, maybe a little Greek. So what the fuck? How did it end up in Latin? Who wrote the original version? And and by the way, the people around there, some of them spoke a lot of Greek, but specifically Jesus and the disciples probably were familiar with Greek. Uh, if they didn't, you know, speak it very well. Going back further, uh, Hebrew. Uh, so how did it end up in Latin? Who wrote the original version? What language was that? Who, who transcribed the original words of God into papyrus? Got that word fucking locked and loaded now, don't I? Uh, let's look into all this. Let's dig into the Bible's origin story and the origin and then exclusion of the lost books of the Bible with a time suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. According to religious scholars, Moses sat down to pen the first words of God into the Pentateuch in 1400 uh, BCE. And he did so while laying comfortably uh, inside his temp, uh, tent uh, atop a Lisa mattress. Yes, Time Suckers, Time Suck is brought to you once again by longtime supporter of the suck, Lisa. Lisa is an innovative, direct to consumer, socially conscious online mattress brand first founded by Moses in 1400 BCE. Bet you always wondered what about Moses' day job, didn't you? Well, he was a mattress mogul. No, of course he wasn't. Lisa started in Virginia Beach, Virginia, just a few years ago, and they are kicking ass. They have a patented universal adaptive feel that features three premium foam layers. They have other comfy goodies to go along with your comfy mattress. They have the Lisa pillow, the blanket, foundation, frame. No wonder Lisa is a Forbes Top 20 startup to watch. So try a Lisa mattress in your own home for 100 nights risk-free. I did, and I absolutely love it. L Lindsay loves it. Uh, now, our, now our two dogs, and there's four of us in this bed now, uh, Penny and, and Gigi, as we call her. Uh, we all love it. Uh, available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, Germany, online with free shipping. This 100% American-made mattress ships compressed in a box right to your door. Uh, you can also go check one out in person at the Lisa Dream Gallery in either Soho, New York City, and Virginia Beach, uh, or over... Uh, or I'm sorry, Soho, New York City, and Virginia Beach, one of those places, or at over 80 West Elm stores nationwide. And you can get the best deal out there on a Lisa mattress right here at Time Suck. Get $125 off and a free pillow when you go to L-E-E-S-A dot com slash Time Suck. Link in the episode description. Do yourself a favor and get one. Okay, now back to Moses and the earliest biblical writings. Again, according to religious scholars, Moses sat down to pen the first words of God into the Pentateuch in 1400 BCE. Now, the Pentateuch is, is the first five books of the Bible. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the word Pentateuch is formed by two Greek words, penta meaning five and tukos meaning balls. Uh, wait, no, that can't be right. No, no, books. It means books. It's not the, it's not the five balls of the Bible. Uh, it can be translated to mean five vessels, uh, five containers, five volume book. In Hebrew, the Pentateuch is the Torah, meaning the law or instruction. However, it's not a done deal that a man named Moses did for sure exist and did for sure write down God's word. A lot of scholars think that a different prophet named Potato Pete wrote the earliest verses of God's word. Uh, Potato Pete was a Levite uh, who spent 20 years lost in Canaan as he gathered wisdom first passed on to him by the Nephites on behalf of the Maccabees that was intended for the juniper berries. And Potato Pete traveled through Jordan and Damascus and Adidas and Converse for three days and five nights and four years uh, at the same time, which is hard to make sense of. No, of course, there was never a dude named Potato Pete. Man, I wish there was, though. How, how much uh, would that name alone change the entire tone of the Old Testament? And God's people followed Potato Pete out of Egypt. 
Who parted the Red Sea? Why, none other than Potato Pete. <laughs> now, the truth, the truth is, we'll probably never in a scholarly sense never know uh, who actually wrote the portions of the Bible attributed to Moses or most of the rest of the Bible for that matter. We just don't have definitive archaeological records, and in all likelihood, we won't ever have those. Uh, outside of biblical scripture, there just isn't uh, uh, any hard archaeological evidence for Moses' existence. That doesn't mean he didn't exist. It just isn't out there. There isn't even an exact time frame for when the events of Exodus may have occurred if they, if they again, did truly occur. Uh, scholarly conjecture spans more than half a millennium. The oldest copy of biblical text that has been found is a little bit of Leviticus that comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and their scientists believe at least 2,000 years old. Some scientists believe they could date uh, back all the way to the 3rd century BCE, and they're not written in Latin. They are written in Hebrew. Uh, Hebrew belongs to the Semitic language group, a family of ancient tongues in the Fertile Crescent that included Akkadian, uh, the dialect of Nimrod in Genesis 10. Hail Nimrod, the great giant space Sasquatch, size of a galaxy with the head of a chupacabra who rides a black unicorn with flaming suns for eyes. The great ancient god of the sun who demands that his followers stomp in the skulls of cocker spaniels to prove their obedience. The great God who holds all of eternal heaven in his glorious ball sack. One ball, the Alpha, the other, the Omega. Hell itself resides in Nimrod's butthole. Now, wait, I, no, wait, that, that's, that's the Nimrod of time sack. Oh, it's, it's awkward. It's probably especially weird for the uh, people in the hotel room next door right now. Uh, this is the biblical Nimrod we're talking about. Uh, the biblical Nimrod was a Mesopotamian king, son of Cush, the grandson of Noah, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord who began by uh, to be mighty in earth. And he was associated in, in non-canonized Christian writings as being rebellious against God and associated with the Tower of Babel. Okay, so anyway, Hebrew yeah, belongs to the Semitic language group that includes, like I said, Nimrod, Zakadian. Also included in this group is uh, Ugartic, uh, the language of the uh, Canaanites, and Aramaic, commonly used in the Persian Empire. And different Hebrew dialects introduced foreign words into the text. For example, Genesis contains some Egyptian expressions, while Joshua, Judges, and Ruth include Canaanite terms. And, and it is these languages that the original tales of the Old Testament were told from person to person during a day and age when very few people knew how to write and written languages, you know, were in their, in their infancy. And then came the uh, Septuagint in the third century BCE. Now, this is a big deal for the Bible. This is essentially the Old Testament first edition, version 1.0, the OG Old Testament with bonus features. Uh, the Septuagint was a Greek translation of the 39 can uh, canonical uh, canonical, can, canonical books of the Old Testament, as well as uh, some books actually written after Malachi. That was the last book of the canonized uh, Christian Old Testament. Man, I got so tongue-tied when I tried to say it earlier. Uh, extra books written before the New Testament, like you guys are surprised. Uh, extra books written before the New Testament. Uh, as Jews dispersed from Israel over the years, they forgot how to read Hebrew, but could read Greek. That was the common language of the day. Now, the word Septuagint uh, means 70 in Latin and refers to the 70 or possibly 72 Jewish scholars who supposedly worked on this translation. Uh, modern Bible scholars have determined that the text was produced in Alexandria, Egypt, and was finished during the reign of Ptolemy uh, Philadelphus, uh, who reigned from 285 to 246 BCE. Ptolemy, sorry. Uh, while some contend that the Septuagint was translated for inclusion in the famous library of Alexandria, more likely the purpose was just to furnish scriptures to uh, Jews of the day who had dispersed from Israel across the ancient world. And again, in addition to the 39 canonical, canonical can fucking books in the Old Testament, the Septuagint uh, includes... Uh, some others that are not considered inspired by God, uh, by Jews or Protestants, but were included for historical or religious reasons. And, and here now we get to the Apocrypha. Now, uh, Jerome, uh, which is, you know, part of the lost books, Jerome, uh, who lived, uh, th 340 to 420 CE was an early Bible scholar called the, uh, he called these non, uh, books that weren't in the canon, uh, the Apocrypha, which means hidden writings. And these hidden writings included Judith, Tobit, Baruch, uh, Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus, the Wisdom of Solomon, Maccabees, uh, first and second, the book, two books of Esdras, uh, the, the books of Esther, uh, additional you know verses to the book of Daniel, and the prayer of the Manessa. Now, more on these type of books and some stories from them uh, a little bit later. So, while we'll soon see that after the time of Jesus' death, a, a variety of New Testaments uh, type books were floating around, but but only some made the final cut. There were also a variety of Old Testament type books floating around that made the cut into that book as well. So this, you know, this kind of, you know, picking the right books happened at, you know, uh, twice, essentially, 
when the, when the Old Testament was canonized and then when the New Testament was. Modern Judaism recognizes the 24 books of the uh, Masoretic text, commonly called the, the Hebrew Bible, as authoritative. Uh, authoritative modern scholarship suggests that the uh, most recently written of these books is uh, of Jonah, Lamentations, and Daniel, all of which uh, have been composed as late as the 2nd century BCE. There's no scholarly consensus as to when the Hebrew Bible canon was fixed. Some scholars argue that it was fixed by the Hasmonean dynasty, 140 to 40 BCE, while others argue it was not fixed until the 2nd century CE or even later. Uh, the Catholic Pontifical Biblical Commission says the formation of the most restricted Hebrew canon is, is later than the formation of the New Testament. So, yeah, a lot of these things have been passed around for a long time. So, And, and how fascinating is this? Like when, when people get really dogmatic about their version of their Judeo-Christian faith— I just always have to uh, agree to disagree. Uh, man, I was never cut out to be a literalist when it came to theological interpretation. And, and just because of what we're learning uh, here today, like I just don't understand how how some people can think that their version of Christianity is the only one that can be right and is without a doubt the undisputed word of a Christian God when the teachings of modern Christianity are historically proven to be an incomplete collection of early Christian teachings added to an existing incomplete collection of ancient Jewish teachings. I mean, I mean, I get believing in the gist of the theological themes and devoting yourself to the overall teachings and the big picture stuff. Uh, I get devoting yourself to the main themes of the Gospels, for example, but I, but I don't get it when people single out one verse or just a few verses and go off on some group, you know, use that for justification, you know, like, like we learned last week with the Westboro Baptist Church, because, you know, that verse could have easily just not been included, you know, and uh, it's— or could have been possibly, you know, mistranslated a little bit. I mean, even a, even as a kid, I would think about that. Like, well, what, what if it didn't, you know, come across correctly in one of the translations? You know, what if it was uh, from a section that barely made the final cuts? What if some other book that was supposed to be included in the final cut but didn't refuted the point that you that you think is so important? This is why religion is so damn hard, man. It, it, you know, it just doesn't have to to make sense. And and often from from a logic standpoint, it just it doesn't make sense. Uh, logically very confusing because it's, it's not based in logic. It's based in a lot of old stories that if, if you don't look at them from a place of being a member of the faithful, uh, they often don't make a lot of sense. But but don't let me uh, dissuade you from your spiritual beliefs. That is not my intent right now. Uh, possessing free will, man, at the end of the day, we get to believe what we want to believe, whether it makes sense or not, and whether those around us like it or not. And it's your right to believe that God makes uh, sure that, uh, you know, that the correct version of his words, that his messages, make it through from one edition to the next. I know that's a common uh, way of thinking about this. And that's, uh, you know, I, who, who the fuck am I to critique that? You know, I guess it's uh, not only the, the frustrating part of religion, it's the beautiful part. No one gets to take your belief away from you. Not historians, not me. You know, as long as it adheres to the basic societal laws of don't kill, don't don't rape, don't, don't steal. The government's not going to try and stop you. Uh, so at, at least our government. So anyway, I don't know. I'll, I'll stop trying to make scientific, logical sense of uh, all of this for the moment. i gotta, I got to stay on topic. Stay focused, Cummins. Stay focused. Uh, the point I'm just trying to make is that early Christians didn't have an agreed upon Bible. And also that early Jews did not have an agreed upon Hebrew Bible. There were a lot of different Jewish tales being told and, and being written. And then later, a lot of Christian tales, you know, coming directly out of the Jewish faith, uh, also being told and written. And some made the mainstream cuts uh, that have lasted until today, and some did not. Now back to the Septuagint, that OG third century Greek, you know, Old Testament in third century BCE. By the first century CE, the time of Jesus Christ, the Septuagint was in widespread use throughout Israel and was read in synagogues. Synagogues, excuse me, the, the Septuagint is, is quoted 340 times in the New Testament against only 33 quotations from the traditional Hebrew Old Testament. Uh, the Apostle Paul's language and style were influenced by the Septuagint. Other apostles quoted from it in their New Testament writings. The order of books in modern Bibles is based on the order in the Septuagint. Uh, Septuagint was adopted as the Old Testament biblical basis of the early Christian church, which led to criticism of the new faith by Orthodox Jews. Uh, they claimed variations from the original Hebrew sources in the text such as Isaiah 7.14, which led to faulty doctrine. You know, in that argued passage, the Hebrew text translates to young woman, referring to Mary, uh, Jesus' mother, while the Septuagint translates to a virgin giving birth to the Savior. Uh, today, only uh, 20 papyrus, fucking nailed it again, text of the Septuagint exists. The Dead Sea Scrolls, discovered in 1947, contain portions of Old Testament books in Hebrew. When those Hebrew documents were compared to the Septuagint, the variances were found to be minor, such as dropped letters or words or grammatical errors. In modern Bible translations, such as the New International Version and the English Standard Version, scholars primarily use the ancient Hebrew texts that were used by those ancient scholars as a source for the Septuagint, turning to the Septuagint itself only in the case of difficult or obscure passages. Okay, so now that we've given an or overview to the evolution of the early formation of Jewish and Christian writings, which is basically, we don't know for sure who wrote it or even exactly when they wrote it, 
We just know that someone wrote it and that various people believed in those various writings. Well, when and who decided which ancient Judeo-Christian teachings were to be included in the Christian version of the Old Testament? Well, now we got to go late, late second century CE. Early Christian bishop uh, Melito of Sardis in modern Turkey was pressed by a friend to obtain an accurate statement of the ancient books as regards their number and their order. And Melito did, and as a result, gave a now famous list of the Old Testament books. Except for its lack of Esther, uh, this list matches today's Jewish and Protestant Old Testament. Uh, Melito was one of a growing community of early Christians. Conditions in the Roman Empire facilitated the spread of new ideas. The empire's well-defined network of roads and waterways allowed easier travel. Uh, and there was also a long kind of a uh, period of relative peace and minimal expansion experienced by the Roman Empire at this time. So it made it safe to travel from one region to another. So while the Romans crucified Christ, uh, they also ironically allowed Christianity to spread better than any culture would have been able to do. Uh, the Roman government had encouraged inhabitants, especially those in urban areas, to learn Greek, the common language allowed ideas to be uh, more easily expressed and understood, and at least some of Jesus' apostles could speak Greek, and they gained converts in Jewish communities around the Mediterranean Sea, and over, 50, or over 40 Christian communities had been established by 100 CE. And, and, and of what church was Melito uh, a bishop? Well, no national or international church organized in the sense in which we think of churches today. The early Christian church was a very loosely organized uh, place, resulting in very diverse early interpretations of Christian beliefs. In part to ensure uh, greater consistency in their teachings, by the end of the second century, Christian communities had evolved uh, to a more structured hierarchy, with the central bishop having authority over the clergy in a city, leading to the development of the metropolitan bishop. Uh, the organization of the church began to mimic that of the Roman Empire. Uh, bishops in politically important cities exerted greater authority over bishops in nearby cities that were smaller. Uh, the churches in Antioch, uh, Alexandria, Rome held the highest positions. Beginning in the second century, bishops often congregated in regional synods uh, to resolve doctrinal and policy issues. By the third century, the bishop of Rome began to act uh, as a court of appeals for problems that other bishops could not resolve. And obviously the position of Roman bishop would, would evolve into uh, the position of pope very shortly. Uh, beginning in the second century CE, two major schools of early Christian thought emerged. Uh, and this directly relates to the lost books of the Bible because the, uh, the group that lost out, that's, that's where uh, they were more into those lost books than the group that won out. It's the proto-Orthodox school of thought uh, versus the school of Gnosticism. And only one of these schools, yeah, is gonna, was going to end up canonizing the New Testament and shaping modern mainstream Christianity. Now, the proto-Orthodox school of thought emerged among uh, early church bishops and leaders such as Ignatius of Antioch. Uh, the proto-Orthodox Christianity bequeathed to subsequent generations four gospels to tell us virtually everything we need to know about life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Paul, they're really into the four gospels, handed down to us uh, the, you know, uh, the entire New Testament, 27 books. The proto-Orthodox believed that, that Christ was both divine as well as a human being, not two halves joined together. Likewise, they regarded God as three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, uh, but only one God altogether. Uh, martyrdom played a major role in proto-Orthodox Christianity. This would lead to all of the saints of the Catholic Church. Another facet of the proto-Orthodox faith was structure, bishops, then later priests, cardinals, pope, and so forth. Uh, the proto-Orthodox faith tended to affirm and develop devotional and confessional traditions, you know, like confessing to priests and all that. The proto-Orthodox believers would form the Catholic Church uh, would canonize the writings of some early Christians into the New Testament that most Christians read today. Uh, the early Christian Catholic Church that Protestantism would later morph out of was based on this school of thought. More on that just a bit. And then there were the Gnostics, all right? Gnosticism is a general term encompassing many different forms of alternative thought in the early Christian world. And it's this group that is central to today's tale of the lost books of the Bible. There were, these were the people that also uh, considered themselves Christians, in the early centuries of Christianity, but they had radically different uh, beliefs than the overwhelming majority of today's Christians. You know, they were a little more open to some radical thoughts on spirituality uh, than were the pro-Orthodox Christians. So let's talk about them, all right? Gnostics did not call themselves Gnostics. Uh, there were many variations of what we now consider to be Gnosticism. Uh, they called themselves, I'm guessing, stuff like Hezekiah, uh, Jezebel, Herodicus, uh, or whatever weird names, you know, they were fucking thrown around at the time. Uh, but seriously, it was a diverse group. Uh, think about all the various denominations of Christianity today, all right? And, and then think of all the little splinter groups, little subsets shooting out from those denominations. Uh, I've been to a couple of non-denominational churches in my day. I've even attended some sermons that, that, that didn't, uh, you know, were given by people who didn't consider themselves to be part of a church at all. Uh, they were part of a fellowship. 
right? Even loosely more structured. I went to, you know, we just meet up in somebody's house. Uh, they felt that the word of God didn't need any earthly spiritual leadership. Well, in the early days, things were in a way even more fractured than that. Uh, if there's one thing that Christians have always agreed upon, it's how they should always disagree about the Bible. <laughs> and in the early days, uh, not only were they disagreeing over biblical interpretation, they disagreed on what the Bible should just even say at all. So, so back to Gnostics, although Gnostic beliefs varied a good deal, we can sum up a few essential points on, on which basically they all agreed. Uh, one is that the material world is bad and the spirit world is good. The material world is under the control of evil, ignorance, or nothingness. Uh, two, a divine spark is somehow trapped in some, but not all, humans, and it alone, of all that exists in this material world, is capable of redemption. Three, salvation is through secret knowledge by which individuals come to know themselves, their origin, and destiny. Right? It feels a little cultish when you start throwing this. Four, since a good God could uh, not have created an evil world, it must have been created by an inferior, ignorant, or evil God. This is where it starts to get real different. Uh, usually the explanation given is that the true good God created or emanated beings, these archons, who either uh, emanated other archons uh, or, or, or conjugated to produce them under a mishap by Sophia, the, like this, some kind of like goddess of wisdom, led to the creation of the, this evil archon who created our world and pretends to be God. <laughs> and, and I'm probably mispronouncing. It's probably Archon instead of Archon. And five, God is a big white dude uh, with long hair and a beard. And his son is younger white dude with long hair and, and a beard. And, uh, and if anyone ever says, uh, actually, God uh, uh, and Jesus probably should look Middle Eastern since that's uh, where people first saw them. And it would be super weird for a Middle Eastern uh, guy 2,000 years ago to look like Jim Caviezel or Ewan McGregor. Uh, you know, then they're like, uh-uh, buddy. Uh-uh, uh-uh. You don't know God. No, uh, uh, of course I made up the fifth thing. Uh, I just always found it funny when I was a kid to see pictures in church of like a Western European looking Jesus, when Jesus, I'm sure looked like a guy that many white American Christians would have been nervous to get on a plane with, uh, back around 2002. But anyway, uh, Gnostics believed in some pretty radical stuff. Not a lot of ideas I'm familiar with. A lot of the Gnostics believed that there is uh, much more of a hierarchy to the spiritual world than what modern Christians believed in. And so we have this proto, these proto-Orthodox Christians, the Gnostic Christians, many of whom also identify in the early centuries being Jewish. Uh, they believe that Jesus was a Messiah, uh, promised to, you know, to come save the Jewish people over and over in the Old Testament. And, and almost all of these people are living in, within the vast realm of the Roman Empire, which during the second century CE stretched uh, to Britain in the West and beyond the Black Sea to the East. It encompassed much of the Middle East, including all of the Holy Land around Jerusalem, covered much of Northern Africa, including the populated areas uh, around the Nile in Northern Egypt. And the Roman Empire was not at that time even close to being a Christian nation. It was largely a polytheistic nation, you know, with, with citizens encouraged and sometimes even commanded to make sacrifices to appease the various Roman gods of Jupiter, Mars, Apollo, Neptune, Minerva, Wendy, and more. Hadrian commands that we pay tribute to Mars, Jupiter, and also Wendy, the great god of quickly prepared but still pretty tasty and inexpensive nourishment. Of course, there was no Wendy, but the others are real. And, and early Romans began to fear that early Christians were going to uh, bring down the Roman Empire by pissing off their gods, by not paying tribute to them because of Christianity's opposition to idolatry. So by the third century, uh, you know, uh, CE, Christians were being persecuted on a regular basis by the Romans. Starting about 250 CE, emperor, empire-wide persecution took place by a decree of the emperor Decius. Uh, the edict was enforced for 18 months, during which time some Christians were killed, others were apostatized which is uh, when they would reject the teachings of Christ to escape execution. Despite persecution, Christian numbers continued to grow and spread within the Roman Empire until eventually a Roman emperor identified as being Christian. And this is when Christianity got a huge boost. This was fucking huge. 312, early Christianity got the big boost when Emperor Constantine took the throne of the Western Roman Empire and issued the Edict of Milan, a new law that banned religious persecution. But because of what I spoke about earlier, the Gnostic beliefs during Constantine's reign, approximately half of those who identified themselves as Christian did not subscribe to the mainstream version of the faith practiced by the emperor. And as you time suckers know, you know, whatever the ruler of the ancient kingdom believed, well, that was what his followers needed to also believe. Constantine feared that disunity would displease God and lead to trouble for his empire. So he took military and judicial measures to eliminate some sects. To resolve other disputes, Constantine began the practice of calling uh, – ecumenical uh, councils to determine binding interpretations of church doctrine. And these initial meetings would lead to a big meeting that would determine which books and which forms of books would be canonized in the Christian Bible. I'm talking about the Council of Nicaea. All right, the Council of Nicaea took place in 325 CE, 12 years before Constantine's death, and Constantine would preside over its initial sessions. The goal of the council was to get everyone to agree on a unified Christian doctrine moving forward. One major point early Christians disagreed on was the question of Christ's divinity. Was Jesus divine and how? Was he literally the son of God or just a good dude who figured some shit out? Uh, 
Did he have a pet dog or not? If he did, was that dog's name Bojangles? Did Bojangles have two eyes or one, three legs or four, two balls or six? Did Bojangles speak Greek, Hebrew, or communicate exclusively through Michael motherfucking McDonald lyrics? Maybe it's not too much to think about. Maybe there's nothing left to say. Maybe I'll stop now. Anywho, back to the real world. In the summer of 325 CE, uh, 318 bishops from across the Roman Empire were invited to the Turkish town of Nicaea, where Constantine had a vacation house. Probably not a hot tub, though. Uh, in, an, in an attempt to find... Actually, maybe he did. Romans had some fucking crazy shit. He had an old version of a hot tub, I'm sure, actually. In an, in an attempt to find common ground in what historians now refer to as the Arian Controversy. It's the first ever worldwide gathering of the Christian church. Well, Jesus was as eternally divine as the Father, said one camp led by the Archbishop Alexander of Alexandria. Another group named the Arians, after their leader Arius the Preacher, saw Jesus as a remarkable leader but inferior to the Father and lacking in absolute divinity. Pot man, pot God, but holy neither. Well, compromise proffered by Constantine was vague but, but you know, blandly pleasing. Jesus and God were of the same substance, he suggested, without delving too much into the nature of that relationship. Uh, a majority of the bishops agreed on the compromise and voted to pass that language into doctrine. And their statement of compromise, which would come to be known as the, the Nicene Creed, formed the basis for modern Christian ideology. The bishops also used the Council of Nicaea to set in stone some church rules that needed clarification. And those canons were the reference point after which all future laws were modeled. As a final order of business, the bishops decided upon a date for the holiest of Christian celebrations, Easter, uh, which was being observed at different times around the empire. Now, Easter, as we all know, is when the Jesus rabbit lays God eggs uh, containing candy and or money for children to find and not appreciate and or understand what their parents have done for them on that day. Uh, no, Easter is the Christian celebration of the resurrection of Jesus three days after having died on the cross. Now, previously linked with the timing of Jewish Passover, Passover, the council settled on a movable day that would never uh, coincide again with the Jewish holiday. It was the first Sunday after the first full moon uh, on or after the vernal equinox. Now, contrary to popular belief, this council had nothing to do with selecting which verses and gospels would be included in the Bible. Uh, bishops did not burn books they deemed heretical uh, uh, during this council either, historians say. Well, after the council decision, everyone agreed, and shit was really theologically steady for uh, several centuries. Uh, yeah, right. No, people still bickered about how to define Jesus. Of course they did. They're still arguing today. Uh, and then in 380 CE, mainstream Christianity, as opposed to Arianism, became the official religion of the Roman Empire, dealing a further blow to the Gnostics and their now lost books. Uh, and then the Catholic Church finally agreed on which writing should go into the Bible and which should be left out almost 60 years after the Council of Nicaea at the Council of Rome in 382 CE, during the time of Pope Damasus. Now, all the important bishops of all the big early Christian churches met in Rome and decided which books to keep. And the written conclusion of their meeting, which greatly further shaped the future of the Catholic Church and the rest of Christianity as well, has survived to this day. And here's what it said. Likewise, it has been said, now indeed we must slay the dragon of heresy. For dragons have destroyed many kingdoms, but the kingdom of Christ will not perish under the flames of blasphemy. Neither orc nor the necromancer led undead should march from hell to find a divided theology. Rather, and so forth, the sword of Abraham shall pass through the blood of Noah, and the sweat of Mary shall put out the great fire of the four-headed beast that flaunts seven seals, and who still thinks henceforth that this is real. Who thinks that the Bible was based in dragon and orc talk? Who is still believing the word of Cabins, the prophet of Nimrod, the master of lies, the master of puppets, Metallica? Is he even just its base extreme of consciousness speak at this? Okay, that was horseshit, obviously. They didn't say that. Here's what they did say. Here's what they did say. Likewise, it has been said. Now, indeed, we must treat the divine scriptures, what the universal Catholic Church accepts and what she ought to shun. The order of the Old Testament begins here. Genesis, one book. Exodus, one book. Leviticus, one book. Numbers, one book. Deuteronomy, one book. Joshua, one book. Judges, one book. Ruth, one book. Kings, four books. Uh, Chronicles, two books. Psalms, one book. Solomon, three books. Proverbs, one book. Ecclesiastes, one book. Canticle of Canticles, one book. Likewise, Wisdom, one book. Ecclesiastes, Sirach, one book. Likewise, the Order of the Prophets, Isaiah, one book. Jeremiah, one book. With Ganoth, that is, with his Lamentations. Ezekiel, one book. Daniel, one book. Osi, one book. Micaeus, one book. Joel, one book. Abdias, one book. Jonas, one book. I didn't fucking, he, just, he keeps going. He gets to all the books. Likewise, the author of the writings of the New and Eternal Testament, which were only the Holy and Catholic Church supports, of the Gospels, according to Matthew, one book, according to Mark, one book, according to Luke, one book, according to John, one book, the, the epistles of Paul the Apostle in number 14, to the Romans, one, to the Corinthians, two, to the Ephesians, one, to the Thessalonians, one, and he goes through all those. 
Likewise, the Apocalypse of John, one book, the Acts of Apostles, one book, like the Canonical Epistles in number seven. And then it goes on and on and on until he wraps up with the Apostle, one epistle. And, uh, and by that time, uh, everyone listening was uh, fast asleep. Sorry, that long list was making me sleep. I had, I had to cut through it. Uh, I felt like I was, I was back in church as a kid again. Once, once I go into the, and this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. My brain's like, and then I'm sleeping, and I'm not paying attention, and I'm tuned out. Okay, so those are the ones that got in. All right, there's a bunch of ones that got in. The ones that made the final cut. And then this canon of Christian literature is the same canon used by the Catholic Church today. And then uh, Damasus encouraged St. Jerome, a fourth century theologian and historian, to translate the scriptures into Latin since Latin was the common language of all educated people at that time. And this translation would become the primary basis for what is known as the Vulgate. Now, the Vulgate is, sorry, the Vulgate, the most significant Latin Bible in the history of Christianity. And possibly really the, the most significant Bible, uh, you know, right, it's right up with like King James and the Vulgate. Because a slightly revised version of the original Vulgate, the new Vulgate, is a typical Latin edition of scriptures still used today in Latin churches. Uh, so, so almost to the lost books now, I promise. Let's hop out of this timeline to summarize which books made it into the Protestant Bible so that we can then jump on to some interesting tales from those lost books. Some weird shit in there. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. Okay, so now we know how the modern Catholic Bible got here. Now, is that the same Bible the Protestants use? No. Uh, here's a quick explanation of the differences. The Protestant Bible, of which the NIV is one version, is seven books shorter than the Bible used by Roman Catholics. But Protestants didn't just take out books. They used a different standard of what should be in the Bible. Uh, the Hebrew Bible has 24 books. The, this list, canon, uh, thought to be, uh, you know, by many to be affirmed at the Council of Gemenia in AD 90 and 118. The Protestant Old Testament includes exactly the same information, but organized into 39 books. For example, the Hebrew book has one book of Samuel, while the Protestant Bible has one and two Samuel. Same book, divided into two parts. In addition to these 39 books, the Catholic Old Testament includes Tobit, Judith, Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, uh, Baruch, Baruch, excuse me, uh, including the letters of Jeremiah, 1 and 2 Maccabees, and additions to Daniel and to Esther. Now, these books were included in the uh, Septuagint. We spoke about, uh, you know, uh, for a while before, that Greek translation of a different older Hebrew canon. Early church fathers who relied on the Septuagint, uh, they could read Greek but not Hebrew, sometimes quoted these extra books as scripture. Now, the status of the books continued to be debated throughout the middle of Middle Ages. Now, in the 16th century, at the time of the Protestant Reformation, Protestants decided that because the additional books weren't in the Hebrew Bible, they shouldn't be in the Christian Bible either, though they actually were included in early editions of the King James Bible. Uh, Catholics at the Council of Trent decided to keep the deuterocanonical books. Uh, incidentally, Protestants and Catholics used the same New Testament, the content of which was defined by Athanasius uh, in 367. Yeah, confused? Yeah, fucking me too. This has been one of the hardest episodes to research because it is so fucking unbelievably convoluted, the history of all this. Like, so preposterously so. <laughs> like, there's been so much disagreement, and the church has been so fractured into so many different little um, places over the years, and everybody has their own councils and their own meetings, and we would want these in. So you can see that the— uh, yeah, it is pretty confusing, but there's been like this main kind of group of books that make it into most of the Bibles, essentially. But And then there's the lost books, and then there's the ones not practiced by any mainstream uh, religion today, uh, including some lost gospels. Now, now, Jesus is usually thought to have died around 30 CE. Christians probably began to produce writings shortly afterwards, although the earliest surviving writings, letters of Paul, were not made for another 20 years or so, around 50, 60 CE. Uh, soon the floodgates open, however, and Christians of varying theological and, and ecclesiastical persuasion wrote all kinds of books. Gospels recounting the words, deeds, and activities of Jesus, uh, accounts of the miraculous lives and teachings of early Christian leaders, acts of the apostles, personal letters, epistles to and from the Christian leaders and communities, uh, prophetic revelations from God concerning how the world uh, came to be or how it was going to end, you know, revelations or apocalypses, so on. Some of these writings may have well been uh, produced by the original apostles of Jesus, possibly. And, and many of the books and letters and teachings not canonized in either the New or Old Testaments were lost for centuries until they turned up in modern times in archaeological discoveries or in systematic searches throughout the monasteries and libraries of the Middle East and Europe. Uh, a lot of these lost books were found in Egypt in 1945. Thirteen leather-bound vellum cortices buried in a sealed jar— how cool to be to find this, were found by a local farmer named Muhammad al-Samans near the upper Egyptian town of Nag Hammadi. Now, th this immensely important discovery includes a large number of primary Gnostic Gospels, 
uh, text once thought to have been entirely destroyed during the early Christian struggle to define orthodoxy, scriptures such as the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Philip, Gospel of Truth, and the discovery and translation of, of this, this find, which is, which is called the Nag Hammadi Library, initially completed in the 1970s, has provided you know, impetus to, to a, a major reevaluation of early Christian history and the nature of Gnosticism. So one of these books is the, is the Coptic Gospel of Thomas. Now, this is one of the most sensational archaeological discoveries. This is one of the last books you guys wanted uh, this, uh, for this episode. Uh, Coptic refers to the language of the Copts, by the way, the final stage of the ancient Egyptian language in which the lost books found at Nag Hammadi were written. Now, the Gospel of Thomas is a collection of Jesus' sayings that claim to have been written by uh, Didymus Judas Thomas. According to some early Christian legends, Thomas was Jesus' twin brother. Uh, that's just according. There's, there's other, you know, uh, possibilities of who this guy was. The book records 114 quote unquote secret teachings of Jesus and includes no other material, no miracles, no passion narrative, no stories of any kind. What ultimately mattered for the author of Thomas was not Jesus' death and resurrection, which he does not narrate or discuss, but the mysterious teachings that he delivered. Now, here's a few of these sayings. One is, um, Jesus says, the person old in his days will not hesitate to ask a child seven days old about the place of life and he will live. For many who are first will become last, and they will become a single one. And, and that is similar to some, uh, you know, uh, teachings that made it into the canonized version of the New Testament. Also interesting, uh, th- th- again, this is why literalism doesn't work for me. Like, like if you interpret this literally, it's like, what? I'm supposed to literally ask a seven-day-old? seven, seven uh, day old? Seven day, seven day old baby. I'm supposed to ask how life works. Pretty sure seven seven day old babies are only capable of answering via uh, crying, uh, pissing, vomiting, uh, and shitting. Is is that the secret of life? Uh, Nimrod demanding puppies being stumped makes more sense than that. Uh, here, here's another one. Jesus says, "Blessed is the lion that a person will eat, and the lion will become human." And Anenimatha is the person whom a lion will eat, and the lion will become human. Uh, uh, what? When, so blessed is some lion who eats some dude and then becomes that dude and anemotha uh, or anana anathema anathema uh, so, which is something or someone that one vehement, vehemently dislikes is the dude who a lion will eat and then become that dude so the lion is blessed for the eating of the dude and the person being eaten by the lion is despised Does, what the fuck. Who he does he care what people think about him? Does he care that he's despised? He just got eaten by a lion. He's he's super dead. I gotta say, researching this episode, it reminds me of going to church as a kid. I just constantly find myself thinking, what in the hell are they talking about? Am I am I missing a soul? Do you have to have a soul for this stuff to make sense? Uh, and I just don't have one. I mean, the golden rule I get. Some of them I get, but the lion one, what? Okay, here's another one from this book. Jesus says, "I have cast fire upon the world, and see, I am guarding it until it blazes." Now, this one makes uh, Jesus sound like a pyromaniac uh, psychopath. I just I just set the world on fire, and now I'm going to watch it burn. A- actually, it, I joke around, but this one actually does kind of make sense to me. Uh, I believe he's saying that he just changed the game, right? He, he burned down the old way, Judaism, and he's made, he made way for the new, Christianity. Oh, shit. Have I put in too many hours in this week's episode? Am I, is, it, is it starting to make sense to me now? Am I joining? What's going on here? Uh, one, one more. Jesus says, I will give you what no eye has seen and what no ear has heard and what no hand has touched and what has not occurred to the human mind. Now he's sounding pretty cool. Now he's sounding like a hip hop hype man or like a, like a fucking cool drug dealer in a movie. Man, you ready for this new shit? I got the dopest shit, man. I got the brand new never before seen shit. No one's touched it. No one's looked at it. It's never been in someone's mind until right now. Oh, I'm excited for that. Uh, okay, so another book. Another book that was found the Nag Hammadi, the Gospel of Philip, which some believe states that Jesus was married to Mary uh, Magdalene. Now, this is one that's very controversial. Uh, here's a translation of that verse that, that some people think points that out. It says, there were three who always walked with the Lord, Mary, his mother, and her sister, and Magdalene, the one uh, who was called his companion. And that's the big word of dispute. His sister and his mother and his companion were each a Mary. Uh, which that's kind of funny. They had to However, the original word that means companion does not necessarily mean a romantic companion. See, this is where we get into that trouble with language. Like we were talking about with love earlier, the same word meaning different things. It could have meant romantic companion, but it also very easily could have not meant that still, uh, scandalous enough to not get included. The church was like, ah, we're not, we're not letting people think that he might've been married. Mm, no, 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 no. That kind of ruins the priest thing for us. Um, then the, here, okay, here's where it starts to get real weird. This one, this is where shit starts to get really crazy and interesting. There's the infancy gospel of Thomas, uh, which accounts uh, G- for Jesus' childhood. 
Now, you know, in the New Testament Gospels, only a couple incidents prior to his baptism are, are talked about. They're the narratives of his birth and infancy in Matthew and Luke. And only in, in Luke, his pilgrimage to Jerusalem, uh, the temple as a 12-year-old. But in the infancy Gospel of Thomas, written by Thomas the Israelite, thought to be by some uh, to be Judas Thomas, Jesus' brother, the Gospel tells tales of Jesus as young as five, and, and, he, and he wasn't always a good kid. Like, <laughs> check out this story. This little child, Jesus, when he was five years old, was playing at the ford of a brook. And he gathered together the waters that flowed there into pools and made them straightway clean and commanded them by his word alone. And having made soft clay, he fashioned thereof twelve sparrows. And it was the Sabbath when he did these things or made them. And there were also many other little children playing with him. After that again, he went through the village and a child ran and dashed against his shoulder. And Jesus was provoked and said unto him, Thou shalt not finish thy course, as, as in go all the way. And he immediately fell down and died. <laughs> But certain when they saw what uh, was done said, whence was this young child born? For that every word of his is an accomplished work. And the parents of him that was dead came unto Joseph and blamed him, saying, Thou that hast such a child canst not dwell with us in the village, or do thou teach him to bless and not to curse, for he slayeth our children. And Joseph said, And Joseph called the young child apart and admonished him, saying, Wherefore doesest thou such things, that these suffer and hate us and persecute us? But Jesus said, I know that these thy words are not thine. Nevertheless, for thy sake I will hold my peace, but they they shall bear this punishment. And straightway they that accused him were smitten with blindness. And they that saw it were sore, afraid, and perplexed, and said concerning him that every word which he spake, whether it were good or bad, was a deed, and became a marvel. And when they saw that Jesus had done so, Joseph arose and took hold upon his ear and wrung it sore. And the young child was wroth and said unto him, It suffices thee to seek and not to find, and verily thou hast done unwisely, thou hast knowest not, what, what the fu- not that I am thine. I swear to God, I'm not adding these letters. Vex me not. Whew, man. Too many thous and thys. Jesus. <laughs> seems a little nuts. He seems a little nuts, man. Killed a kid for bumping into him. Uh, right? And then when the kid's parents are like, hey, man, we fucking we don't appreciate you. You just killed. The, or they, they go to his dad, Joseph, and they're like, hey, we don't like that you, your kid killed our kid. And then uh, Jesus blinds him. And then his dad rings him by the ear for blinding the neighbors. Not surprised that book didn't make it into the final collection. It, that one, it just, he just seems like a fucking maniac psychopath. <laughs> like, what, what is happening? Uh, not surprised that one didn't make it, it, it into the final collection. Uh, if, if I knew that Kyler or Moreau could just use their minds to blind people uh, or just, you know, kill, a, kill somebody with a word, uh, guess who's never getting in trouble again? You know, my wife, Lindsay, could be like, uh, Kyler killed both the dogs today. You have to talk to him. You have to do something. Yeah, we have to, we have to bury those dogs is what we have to do. Sucks, man. Uh, the dogs clearly did something to bring this on. I'm not. I'm not getting after him. You have to say something. Oh, I'll say something. I'll say, "What would you like for dinner tonight, buddy? Ice cream with more ice cream for dessert? Coming, coming right up. Thanks for not taking my sight today. Thanks for not killing me with the word. You, if you want to stand up to that little devil wizard, you fucking you go get it, there, Lindsay. Even crazier in this book is the Virgin Mary uh, burning a lady's hand clean off with her vagina. I'm not kidding. Yep, uh, a good old-fashioned vagina fire lit up a few verses of this book. Uh, after Mary goes into labor, to the, the birth of God, you know, Son of God himself, Joseph finds her a midwife. However, the midwife proves, re- proves redundant. Little Jesus is born via a bright cloud and a flash of light. Uh, he shows up in Mary's arms, you know, meaning that he never travels down the birth canal. Well, the midwife then leaves and tells another woman named Salome about the crazy shit she just watched. Salome is skeptical. Uh, yeah, I bet. Be, being a reasonable woman, she wants to test the, immaculate, the immaculateness of Jesus' birth by trying to stick a finger into Mary's baby hole. And Mary does not fight the virginity inspection and immediately positions herself so that Salome can inspect her. Salome enters Mary's vagina uh, with her fingers, and then she cries out, Woe for my lawlessness and the unbelief that made me test the living God. Look, my hand is falling away from me and being consumed in fire. What the fuck? Her hand catches on fire and falls off because she touched Mary's vajay. Uh, She just found out the hard way. You don't fuck around with God's mom's vagina. However, since she was just trying to make sure Mary wasn't trying to trick everyone into believing into a false god, the real god takes pity on Salome, and an angel shows up and tells Salome to touch baby Jesus so she can get a brand new hand. Right? Uh, Okay. So that happens. Then there's another, there's so many of these books. There's there's many, many of these books, lost books. There's the second treaty of the great Seth. Seriously, uh, Seth. 
It's not one of my weird names I'm throwing in there. Doesn't have the biblical ring that the names Luke and Paul do to me, right? And ha- now we shall meet Seth. I don't know. It just doesn't feel biblical. Anyway, the author is unknown, and the Seth reference in the title appears nowhere in the text. Instead, Seth is thought to reference a third son of Adam and Eve, to whom Gnosis was first revealed, according to some Gnostics. Uh, Cain, Abel, and the great Seth, the Gnostic. Fucking why not? The author appears to belong to a group of Gnostics who maintain that Jesus Christ was not crucified on the cross. There was this belief by, by some. Instead, the text says that si- Simon of Cyrene, uh, the man compelled by the Romans to carry the cross of Jesus as Jesus was taken to his crucifixion, was mistaken for Jesus and then crucified in his place. And then Jesus is described as standing by and, quote, laughing at their ignorance. What the f- That makes Jesus look like a huge asshole. Ha <laughs> ha, Romans, you missed me. You think that you have me nailed to that cross, left out slowly to die of exposure and great pain over the course of a few days, just a measurable agony. But joke's on you. Joke's on you. Some other dude who meant me no harm is suffering immensely right now instead. Ha 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 ha. How funny is that? You think Simon is me? Well, fuck you and fuck Simon. Yeah. Uh, not surprised that one didn't make the final canonization. Then there's some the super wacky lost book, The Acts of John, a collection of narratives and traditions ascribed to John the Apostle, uh, considered so heretical by the early church that after the Second Council of Nicaea in AD 70 or CE 787, excuse me, another meeting of theological minds, most of the existing copies of this book were burned and destroyed. They're like, we have to get rid of this thing completely. And uh, check out a story from this book. John is traveling around to spread the gospel as far as wide as he can. You know, he's heading on those the ancient Roman roads. He's amassed a decent following. Uh, the group he's traveling with then comes to an abandoned inn, and they decide to rest for the night, which would be great if this inn's bed wasn't infested with bed bugs. That, uh, that would suck. As a traveler, that would terribly suck. How do the apostles know that there are bed bugs? Because John talks to them. Mm-hmm. He talks directly to the bugs. <laughs> he says, I say unto you, O bugs, behave yourselves, one and all. And leave your abode for this night and remain quiet in one place and keep your distance from the servants of God. Do you hear what I'm saying? He's telling the bugs to get off the bed, go hide somewhere and just fucking chill out for a while. Behave yourselves. Uh, bed bugs don't bite us to be dicks. They're parasites. Biting big mammals is how they stay alive. It's how they feed. <laughs> I love his, he has his attitude of stop, stop being dicks, bugs. Just leave your, your abode. Go starve in the corner. Well, the next morning when the group wakes up, they see a brigade of bed bugs standing patiently outside the door of the inn, just waiting. And then John, <laughs> and then John says, since ye have well behaved yourselves in hearkening to my rebuke, come unto your place. You've been very good, bugs. Thank you for starving in the hallway. I greatly appreciate it. Get on in. Go, go back. Go on in there. Yeah, he invites the bed bugs back into the house and they immediately crawl back into the bed and disappear into the crevices. Win, win. Oh my, I picture them, the little bugs waiting outside the door, just like, like, like a little pyramid of bed bugs, just kind of standing on each other's shoulders. So yeah, I, I can't, I gotta say, I can't blame the church, the early church for burning that. We're like, we need bugging people to take our, us seriously. We cannot, we cannot have our, our bishop, we cannot have our priests, you know, talking, talk, trying to explain how this is a, a really important thing that God wants us to know about this weird, get the bud, bed bugs to go wait in the hall story. Oh, and then she gets even weirder. She gets even weirder in another lost book, The Acts of Peter. Okay, in this book, Peter <laughs> Peter has a bizarre grudge uh, against a Jewish magician named Simon. Fucking Simon, the Jewish magician. Oh, he doesn't like this magician. And he tries to show him up in kind of a sort of wizard duel, which you guys know I like. It's a wizard duel. Uh, Simon, according to Peter, was leading people astray and sullying God's name. And in Peter's head, the whole Simon thing could be solved with a few miracles. Miracle one, give a dog the voice of man. To send this Copperfield wannabe a warning. This is what it says. And Peter, seeing a great dog bound with a strong chain, went to him and loosed him. And when he was loosed, the dog received a man's voice and said unto Peter, What dost thou bid me to do, thou servant of the unspeakable and living God? Well, if he's unspeakable, why are you talking, dog? And then Peter says, Peter said unto him, Go in and say unto Simon in the midst of his company, Peter saith unto thee, Come forth abroad. For thy sake am I come to Rome. Thou wicked one and deceiver of simple souls. And immediately the dog ran and entered in and rushed into the midst of them that were with Simon and lifted up his forefeet and in a loud voice said, uh, wait, what? Uh, this dog is not only speaking <laughs> to the magician in a human voice, but it's standing up on its hind legs to do so. Oh man, that would have been cool to see. And then the dog delivers Peter's message. But Simon saith to the dog, say that I am not here. To which the dog replies, 
Hast thou taken thought so long to say at last, tell him that I am not within? Out art thou not ashamed to utter thy feeble and useless words against Peter, the minister and apostle of Christ? So now the dog is uh, fucking shaming, throwing some shade on Simon. Simon gets uh, uh, shamed by a walking, shockingly eloquent dog. Eventually, the dog reports back to Peter. And when the dog had said this, he fell down at the apostle Peter's feet and gave up the ghost. What the fuck? He just dies. Why does the dog have to die in this story? It passes on the message. It does its job, you know, as well as it can. It even, it even puts a little extra effort into it. It even pops up on his hind legs to talk to some dude. And then it has to, has to die at his feet. Man, Peter, you don't know how to write a good story, buddy. The death of the dog character adds nothing to the narrative other than random sadness, needless sadness. Maybe, I don't know, who, who, maybe the magician did something. Maybe the magician did something, put a spell on that dog. Well, after the dog dies, Peter tries out another miracle. He looks around the room, completely overlooking the fact that the greatest dog that has ever lived is just dead right in front of him. He notices a smoked herring or sardine, depending on the translation, in the window and asks the crown <laughs> if he should resurrect it. If ye now see this swimming in the water like fish, will ye be able to believe in him whom I preach? Because, you know, he's trying to get people to believe in him, not the magician. And, uh, and he steps over the dead dog, grabs the fish, throws uh, what is undoubtedly someone's supper into the bath. It, it immediately starts swimming. And seeing this, many follow Peter and believe in the Lord. But again, horrible story construction. No one gives a shit about a smoked sardine. We, we Everyone cares about the dog. If you can bring an animal back from the dead, why would you pick a fucking stupid sardine instead of the talking dog that was doing your bidding? A talking dog is worth like a billion sardines. No, a talking dog is worth more. One talking dog greater than all sardines. But what about that magician, man? What about that wizard battle? What's going on there now? Well, to recap, Peter's given a dog a voice and resurrected a fish. Simon knows he's got to do something big. He's got to get a big trick. Got to pull a big trick out of the bag. So, uh, so he does because he starts flying. Seriously. He starts flying over Rome just, just by himself, like Superman in it. Just fucking soaring around in the sky. Uh, man, I'm not a big magician guy, but that's a serious trick. I would, I would pay to see that magician flying all over the city. Uh, yep. That beats the hell out of pulling a bunch of silk scarves out of a hat. Well, Peter now goes back into the scripture. Peter seeing the strangest of the sight cried unto the Lord Jesus Christ. If thou suffer this man to accomplish that, which he hath set about now, will all they that have believed on thee be offended and the signs and wonders, which thou hast given them the through me will not be believed. Hasten thy grace, O Lord, and let him fall from the height and be disabled. <laughs> and let him not die, but be brought to naught and break his leg in three places. And he fell from the height and broke his leg in three places. What the fuck? So this guy, who's not on God's side, the magician, he can fly. And the guy who is on God's side, Peter, can fly. But he can beg God to break the bones of someone who else who can fly. Uh, <laughs> Peter, one of Jesus' founders, the, the mythical first pope of the Catholic Church, has just asked God to make this man fall to the ground and have his leg broken in three places. And, and because God also apparently doesn't care for this magician, uh, he does what Peter asks. And then it gets even more nonsensically violent. No sooner has Simon fallen to the ground and shattered his leg than every man cast stones at him and went away home. Uh, okay. So this group here, they just got uh, you know excited about the sardine trick. They see this guy fly around, but then they see his leg broken down. And then they're like, yeah, let's, let's fucking hit him with some rocks as if he's not wounded enough. And so now Simon's writhing around on the ground in pain with a broken leg. He's all beat up with rocks. <laughs> and, then, and then he dies in this story a little bit later while he's having his leg operated on. So instead of, instead of praying for Solomon to have just like a quick and painless death, he ends up putting Solomon, or Simon, excuse me, Simon, through the worst physical and emotional pain imaginable. And then, and then he dies. Uh, again, makes sense that that book was lost. Okay. Now, there was another group of old lost books, uh, besides the Nag Hammadi uh, Library. There was the uh, lost books found when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Now, the, the two bigs uh, <clears throat> were, the, were the Nag Hammadi Library and the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the big finds concerning lost books. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in a series of 12 caves around the site known as the Wadi Qumran near the Dead Sea in the west bank of the Jordan River. Uh, between 1946 and 1957 by Bedouin shepherds and a team of archaeologists. In the caves were a number of pots. Some of the jars were still intact. You know, you know these fucking shepherds go in there. Lids are sealed in the, on, uh, on, these, on these jars. The shepherds opened the seals to reveal ancient scrolls wrapped in linen, blackened with age. The scrolls range in dates from the 3rd century BCE to the 1st century of the Common Era. While Hebrew is the most frequently used language in the scrolls, about 15% were written in Aramaic and several in Greek. And those Bedouin shepherds came across some seriously weird shit. One of the main discoveries from the caves of Qumran is, is a scroll given the name the Book of Giants. 
Now, the book of Giants, like the book of Enoch, another non-canonized Judeo-Christian book, concerns itself with the uh, Nephilim, which in the Enoch version are the offspring of fallen angels, also called the Watchers. The angels saw the beauty of the daughters of men. They broke their allegiance to heaven, descended to earth, married women, and uh, had sex with them and fathered giants. And then, uh, then the giants just start wreaking havoc on earth. The book attempts to fill in the details about the giants and their offspring that the book of Enoch is lacking. Uh, there's a theory that the, the, that the book of giants was actually part of the book of Enoch at one time. Well, the text relates how some giants, uh, sons of fallen angels, were compelled to dream. In these dreams, they foresaw some biblical deluge. They saw their own demise and decided to fight God. Like Enoch, like, I don't know, helps them have some kind of vision. In the vision, they see that, you know, they're, they're going to, the race is going to go away. So they get pissed off about it. They decide, they decide to fight God. And then there's this crazy battle, uh, between giants and God in heaven. Uh, angels die in this battle. Gi the giants all die. There's, there's even a fight between an archangel and, and a sea monster known as Leviathan in this fucking battle. Eventually God wins. All the giants are destroyed. Super, super uh, crazy. And, and, and then there are other truly lost books of which no copies exist. And we know about them because they're mentioned Sometimes mentioned in other lost books or, or mentioned in, you know, by ancient biblical scholars like Epiphanes of Salamis, an early 4th century bishop located in Cyprus and a religious scholar. Now, um, this dude was a strong defender of proto-Orthodox beliefs and staunchly opposed to strange Gnostic beliefs and compiled a long list of Gnostic texts he considered to be heresy, uh, heresy into a book called the uh, Panarian. And some seriously weird shit is referenced in these books. This is going to get even crazier than it's already been. One, this is the craziest. One lost book referenced by uh, Epiphanius in, in the Panarian is called The Questions of Mary. It's about Mary Magdalene. And, and here's what he says in one of these. He's talking about this book. He says, for in the so-called greater questions of Mary, there are also lesser ones forged by them. They claim that he reveals it to her after taking her aside on the mountain, praying, producing a woman from his side, beginning to have sex with her, and then partaking of his omission, if you please, to show that thus we must do that we may live. And when Mary was alarmed and fell to the ground, he raised her up and said to her, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Uh, yeah. Can definitely see why this one didn't make the cut. Holy shit. In case you missed it, this book uh, is referencing uh, Jesus eating his own semen. For real. That's what he's talking about there. And there was apparently a group of early Christian Gnostics that worshipped in that manner. They were known as the Borberites, and they were freaky as fuck. According to Epiphanius, Epiphanius, the Borberites recognized each other with a sweet little secret handshake, and then immediately we just start banging. And then once everyone was nice and horny, the woman in the – this is what he says, this uh, scholar, he wrote, uh, writes, uh, The woman and man receive the man's omission on their own hands, and then they eat it partaking of their own dirt, and they say, this is the body of Christ. They likewise take the unclean menstrual blood and eat it in common, and they say, this is the blood of Christ. So that's where Rasputin got it. Remember talking about that freak in Time Suck 47? Remember that Russian fucking maniac would tell women that his actual, that his dick was a conduit to God and that sucking it was a spiritual event, was a way of receiving enlightenment? Yeah, I feel like he may have been familiar with some of these early Gnostic works. So... <laughs> Pretty crazy stuff. I think pretty easy to see why a lot of it didn't make it uh, into the canon. All right. I could go on and on with more examples of lost books, but those are some of the weirder ones, uh, stories from them. But, and you get the idea. The world's most influential book, the Bible, is not a book at all. It's a collection of ancient man's attempt to first define the God of the Old Testament and then to define Jesus Christ and his teachings and the New Testament. And there was a lot of disagreement about who was the Hebrew God. And then there was a lot more disagreement about who Jesus was and what he was trying to say. And again, not trying to shake anyone's faith. You choose to believe that the formation of the Bible was uh, guided by God's hand. That's your right, you know, uh, and it's a matter of faith. Um, you know, uh, but what you can argue, at least not with any evidence is, is that it wasn't modified and tweaked. Uh, there was a lot of interesting books, man, floating around and some of them ended up in the Bible and some were lost. And, and, and I used two great books for my primary sources today. One is called lost scriptures, books that did not make it into the new Testament by Bart D. Ehrman and the book of giants, the watchers, Nephilim and the book of Enoch by Joseph Lumpkin and the Amazon reviews of these books is where we're heading for today's fantastic idiots of the internet. Idiots of the internet. 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 Under one of these thoroughly informative books, a user who identifies only as Amazon customer writes one star to kick off their one star information. In their review, 
uh, to, or to get off their one-star review, excuse me, and here's what the review says. Too much information. Wow, what an ignorant piece of shit. What didn't you like about the compendium of lost books of the Bible? Too many. There's too many of them. I wanted to learn a little bit, not a lot. I didn't want so much learning when I bought Book of Knowledge. Now, of course, this person spelled two, T-W-O, classic idiot, hating something for not being exactly what they wanted when what they wanted didn't make any sense, right? Why did you give the new Queens of the Stone Age album a one-star review? I didn't expect so much music on the music album. Unbelievable. Uh, Amazon user Michael De La Vega is even dumber. This is about as dumb as you can possibly get with the book review. Uh, Michael leaves a one-star review, again, uh, with the subject of one star. You know, just so you know for sure that he's leaving a one-star review. And he writes, can you cancel this order? I did not order this ebook because I don't have a Kindle. Uh, well, uh, for starters, dumb shit, you did order it. That, that's why you got it. That's how ordering things work. Uh, that's how things show up from Amazon and other re uh, online retail sellers uh, when you order them. And even if you didn't, why the fuck would you punish the author for their book accidentally showing up in your computer? It's not their fault. Oh, I know, because you're a complete moron. Call Amazon and complain. Let them silently make fun of you. Leave a one-star review on the Amazon app, right? About the Amazon app. Oh my God. Amazon user Linda Sinclair hates both the books she tried to read and hates Amazon as she makes abundantly clear in her one-star review. Subject, not good. Message, I can't understand why you have to type so many words to rate something on her. I will not rate more because of having to say so much about nothing. Uh, well, Linda, uh, companies force you to type something so dumb trolls like yourself don't just go off on a one-star hatchet fest throughout the comment section. You know, they do it so spam bots, the coded equivalent of yourself, can't start lighting up the reviews with thousands of nonsense one-star reviews. And why are you angrily telling Amazon you won't rate any more due to their system? Are, are you under the impression that they're dying for people like you just to quickly and easily be able to shit all over their products, you fucking moron? How do you not understand that they would love to have you never rate anything ever again? Oh, yeah, because you're a selfish, ignorant asshole. Uh, one more. Amazon user slash small, fr frightened, illogical human being, uh, NP1982, wrote a one-star review with the subject line, this has things ungodly in it got really weird. <laughs> and then they wrote, this book was good at first and then got very unbiblical. I think I will burn it. I burned it. It's an attempt to deface God, the, and Jesus. It way up set me. Oh, this person is barely literate. I, I, was, I was actually fixing some mistakes as I read that. Holy fuck, are you ridiculous, ignorant, ridiculously ignorant. My God, NP, 1982. The author, uh, in this case, Bart Ehrman, didn't write the lost books of the Bible, you dipshit. He compiled them. He didn't choose what they would say. And you're going to burn them because they upset you and you're going to give him a one-star review for what, uh, doing exactly what he said he was going to do in the premise of the book? God, if we could only send you back to the dark ages where you belong, if only we could like trade people like, with like other eras of history, like if we could just take our idiots and send them to medieval Europe and then take out of medieval Europe, like the curious mind stuck in that fucking hellhole and give them access to all the knowledge information that people like NP1982 have no desire to obtain. That would be so great. Right. Uh, let these, let those people indulge in the curiosity that is truly wasted on these idiots of the internet. Idiots of the internet. Okay, time suckers. I hope you liked today's ride. It was a tough one, man. It was a tough one. I really debated with how to structure it. I thought about just focusing on the scripture and stories, the lost books themselves, but but honestly, I, I just think I just felt like that was going to get too repetitive. Um, uh, wow, this person said, um, you know, this weird thing, this story featured this weird creature, etc. Interesting, but but I think more interesting to use the lost books to give us a better understanding of the books that aren't lost. Those included in the Bible. You know, I, I knew that there were other books that were never included in the Bible, but I just I just didn't really grasp how much disagreement there was regarding how to form the Bible before this past week. I really enjoyed, as hard as it was, uh, all this research. Man, religion is tricky, and, and, and if you're looking for logical answers, you're just not going to find them. Honestly, I just I don't understand why certain theologians even try. It's like if you want to believe, just believe, but don't waste your time uh, trying trying to you know believe because belief is the only logical choice. Uh, you know, to, to, to make all the stories add up. They don't have to. They don't. They don't have to all make sense. That's okay. 
sometimes mystery can be good, you know? Uh, that's what that's what's fun about it. I also understand why there's so much disagreement within the Christian community now on a different level, why there's so many various denominations, so many subsets uh, within each denomination. I mean, of course there's endless disagreement. The foundation of the religion is built on varying opinions and, and a multitude of texts and teachings that disagree with each other. Faith, man, it just speaks to you or it doesn't. And if it speaks to you, well, God bless you. If the Christian faith works for you, peace be with you. No shade as I say that at all. Uh, man, I got a lot of, met so many cool Christian time suckers. And if religion doesn't speak to you, well, you know what? Nim- Nimrod still loves you. So hail Nimrod. N- time sucks still here. It's not a religion. Uh, I, got, I got no afterlife for you. But uh, but based on all the people I've met this past year and a half, it clearly speaks strongly to a lot of you. And uh, I'm here for you. All right. Time for some top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. One, the King James Bible was first published in 1611 and was commissioned by a witch hunter who wrote a field guide for how to catch necromancers and spot the devil in 1597. We live in a strange world, don't we? Two, the Romans, the killers of Christ, were also the key to the development of Christianity. The ancient system of Roman roads allowed a new religion to spread throughout the vast Roman Empire far more quickly uh, uh, you know, than any other empire would have allowed it to spread. And, uh, and due to this expansion, the religion reached an actual, the religion reached an actual emperor, Constantine, uh, who took the throne in 312. Three, there were two basic camps of Christians in the early days. There was Orthodox Christians, the Proto-Orthodox, and the Gnostics. And a lot of the Gnostics seemed to be super fucking weird. If you consider taking the sacrament through wiener juice to be weird, which I definitely do. Four, the Catholic Church finally agreed on which writings should go into the Bible and which should be left out almost 60 years after the Council of Nicaea at the Council of Rome in 382 CE. Did not know that. And five, new info just last year in 2017, a new copy of a lost book was found, another copy of the first Apocalypse of James. One of the books found in the Nag Hammadi discovery of 1945 was found in the library archives of Oxford uh, University. Uh, Jeffrey Smith and Brent Landau, religious studies scholars at the University of Texas at Austin, located the rare text in Oxford University archives earlier this, uh, the year of 2017. Uh, The experts found several 5th or 6th century CE Greek fragments of the first Apocalypse of James. To say that we were excited once we realized what we'd found is an understatement, said Smith, assistant professor of religious studies, in a statement. We never suspected that Greek fragments of the first apocalypse of James survived from antiquity, but there they were right in front of us. And discoveries are still occurring. Isn't that intense? Discoveries are still occurring. What if some mind-blowing one is right around the corner? Can you imagine? Like, what if some new Egyptian tomb is unearthed and there's a huge library? How cool would that be? And like, we all find out just something fucking crazy. Like, what if we all found out that like the world's major religions are all part of the same truth and that that truth is that the space lizards are real. And it was the space lizards who killed Jesus to keep him from busting us out of David Icke's moon matrix. Okay, I don't think we're going to find anything that weird. But we could find something cool. I hope so. I like it when things get weird. I like when things keep evolving. Uh, if it happens, I'm sure one of you will send me an update. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Lost books of the Bible have been sucked. Thank you, Space Lizards, for voting on this topic, man. I am but a conduit of Nimrod's will, and you are the controllers of Nimrod. Or does Nimrod control you? Uh Uh-oh. There may start to be some theological debates breaking out within the Time Suck community itself. Uh, Thanks to Harmony Bellacamp, Jesse Dobner, Lindsey Cummins, Josh Krell, entire Time Suck team. Uh, And now we have a Friday episode coming up, and it's the first of a big two-parter. Man, I love two-parters. Two episodes on the demonic possession of Anna Elizabeth and Elise Michelle. Yes, it's been too long since we had some paranormal, fucking terrifying horror here on The Suck. That's right. Hail Lucifina. I've gotten such good feedback on the Amityville and the Shadow People episodes that it felt right to get scared all over again. And this story is terrifying. Uh, 1968. When uh, Michelle was 16, she experienced a seizure and was diagnosed with psychosis caused by temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, She soon had depression and was treated at a psychiatric hospital. By the time she was 20, she had become intolerant of various religious objects and began to hear voices. Her condition worsened despite medication. She became suicidal, also displaying other symptoms for which she took medication as well. After taking psychiatric medications for five years and having them fail to improve her symptoms, her family became convinced she was possessed by a demon. And as a result, her family appealed to the Catholic Church for an exorcism. And what happened next became the basis for the horror film, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Shit got crazy. And I can't wait to suck it. Hail Nimrod. Time to expand the mind into the possibility that not everything in this world can be rationally explained yet again, just like we did on this week's theology. Now, let's find out what you suckers have been up to these past few weeks with some Time Sucker updates. Updates. 
Get your time sucker updates. Our first update is from kick-ass mother sucker Grayson Gist. Grayson writes, Dear Lord Suckmaster Cummins IV, I absolutely loved that you covered the WBC. You did a fantastic job on that episode. As always, I am from Kansas City, Missouri. I have seen these mofos in person, even stopped by to check out their church. I joined the Air Force in 2012, and I distinctly remember sitting on the hood of my car, staring at their picture, uh, prison-esque church with their American flags hung upside down with rainbows instead of stripes and wondering whether or not some people deserve protection. Unfortunately, even shitheads do. Anyway, as I was approaching their compound, I noticed that there was a house across the street that was painted like the rainbow and had a donation box with a sign that read plantingpeace.org. It was the most fantastic thing I'd seen in a long time. The amount of trolling while supporting people who are different was awe-inspiring. I tossed some money in there, gave the WC the finger, and went about my day. Hopefully, you can get that message out to fellow time suckers to help support the people that prevent these lunatics from hurting people that already possibly feel down about who they are. Also, Google map the church and scroll to the other side of the street. It's worth a look. Sincerely, Grayson, a.k.a. Taco, a.k.a. officially the newest space lizard. Hail Nimrod. Oh, man. Thank you so much, man. Thanks for uh, – I would have never known about that. Thanks for sending that uh, our way. Plantingpeace.org. That is really cool, man. Uh, just uh, rushing around this week. I didn't have time to check out uh, the Google uh, you know, image of that, but I'll have to give it a look. And, uh, and I'm so glad you found that, man, and I'm so glad you let us know. Well, way to combat some hate there, dude. Appreciate it. Knowledge Nimrod, Space Lizard. Okay, next up, little love from Super Sucker, Vanessa Evans. Vanessa writes, Dear Dr. Reverend Master Sucker, I've been a big fan for years and a time sucker for the past two. I wanted to write in to thank you for all the work you do. I am currently slogging through my last semester of college and hating every minute of it. Your podcast reassures me that while I'm not a fan of school, I still love learning. Something happened recently that I wanted to share with you. I had to go get blood work done, something that sends me anxiety or sends my anxiety off the charts. I asked a nurse if I could listen to music while she was drawing blood, and I put in the Norse mythology episode. <laughs> Your sweet tones plus the howls of Bojangles immediately calmed me down. It was the first time in my entire life I did not pass out while getting blood drawn. I owe that to you. Sorry for the long email, but I wanted to let you know how much your comedy and time suck means to me. Keep doing what you're doing. Lots of love to you and your family. Hail Nimrod, Vanessa Evans. Vanessa Evans, excuse me. Well, God, I love you, Vanessa Evans. That was so nice. <laughs> that's so awesome that you were able to, to use that to get through your blood work, man. I know that's uh, hard for a lot of people. Uh, I'm lucky I don't suffer from that. My mom, though, uh, passes out every time she has to have anything uh, done with her blood. Or, or, you know, borderline passes out. <laughs> I have a cousin that uh, passes out every time she has to have some some blood stuff done. Um, so I'm so glad that that worked. Who knew? Who knew that the uh, that the suck could help with some blood work? I appreciate that. And thanks for saying, uh, yeah, hi to my family. Next up, kick-ass Christian uh, time sucker, Mary Faust. Mary writes, hey, Dan, I love what you do, and I'm so happy to have found your amazing podcast. It's made my life immeasurably better. Uh, wanted to send you a note to give you one Christian's perspective on your WBC episode. I am a Christian because I believe in the love God has for every person he has created, and I don't believe for a minute that he would close the gates of heaven to anyone who is kind to others and spend their li- and spends their lives doing good. And that definitely includes a majority of gay people and definitely does not include any member of this disgusting cult. The WBC does not speak for me, nor for any reasonable Christian, I would think. I believe in heaven and hell, and I think it's very clear where these hateful monsters are going to end up. Thanks for always putting out great work and for being so involved with your listeners. Your hard work does not go unnoticed. Hail Nimrod and be gone, Lucifina. Well, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, and I wanted to include that because I know uh, a lot of the Christian listeners were uh, upset by how hateful those people were and didn't want to be associated, and you're definitely not. And you know, and I hope, and I hope those people, like like the one who got out that we talked about, is now give his TED talks and such. I hope other uh, members of the WBC man uh, wise up, and you know, before they waste the rest of their lives, you know, get the hell out of that little dangerous, disgusting little cult of theirs. So yes, so Hail Nimrod to be gone, Lucifina. Thank you. Another awesome update from a big, wonderful bowl of suck, Daniel Griffin. Daniel writes, what's up, DJ Suckface? My name is Daniel Griffin, and I love he actually phonetically put Daniel Griffin as if I don't know how to pronounce Daniel, which is hilarious. I know we technically have the same name, but I just never know with you. <laughs> this will probably be a long message, but I've got a lot to say. I'm a loyal listener, space lizard, and longtime stand-up fan. I've actually called into the Secret Suck before. Uh, the guy who did a triple M panic at the disco. That was awesome. I'm writing because this week's episode struck a painful nerve for me. My dad is a Baptist pastor and cross-cultural studies professor, a.k.a. a reverend doctor. I was brought up in the church, and I'm attending a Christian college right now. Not one, <laughs> not one like the weirdos at Bob Jones. Every time I even think about those disgraceful shitbags at Westboro Baptist Church, my heart breaks. But I don't want to talk about the evil that they do, but that the good that the Christians I know have done. And continue to do. Our friends and family have been doing humanitarian work all across the world, primarily in the Middle East. Myself, my sister, my dad, and about a dozen of my classmates have been going to Jordan the past few years to try to help with the displaced Syrian refugees in that area. 
The trip was paid for with donations and money from our own pockets. I personally know dozens, if not hundreds of people who have dedicated their lives to serving people in third world countries. Some of them have even sacrificed their own life. These people were willing to give up their lives because they believed the people they were serving were worth loving. I wanted to tell you this not to try to make myself or my friends sound cool, but to give you a contrast to the hate. Because it is people like this who truly believe in sharing the love of God. These are the people I am proud to be in the community with, and these are the people who I am proud to say worship the same God as me. I have so much more I would like to say, but I'll end on this. I believe you're coming to the West Palm Beach this summer, uh, the improv. I think I am, yeah. Uh, I would like to ask you if you are willing to stage a protest with me. In order to protest the hateful homophobia that Westboro Baptist Church vomits, I would like to... I'd like to make love to you. If we can do it on stage, that would be even better. Just hot Dan on Dan action. Dan squared, if you will. You can be a pitcher if you, if you prefer. I'm willing to make that sacrifice. Big fan. I love all that you do. Love Daniel Griffin. That is hilarious, dude. And yes, just a good reminder that there's so many great people. And, and how interesting in light of today's episode, you know, whether, whether like there's all these books floating around, whatever, all that really matters is what people do with the information. And you are clearly doing wonderful things uh, with Christianity. And so that's awesome, man. Hail Nimrod. And I love you sharing that. And that was hilarious at the end. La one last one. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised to find out we have a space lizard who has a degree from Bob Jones University. The place where you, can, you can't even have a faux, faux hawk. The place where you can't watch PG-13 movies. Uh, cool as heck, Time Sucker Supreme Marcus Hildebrand writes in, Dear Master Sucker, just listened to the new suck and thought your Bob Jones rant was hilarious because I had to put up with all those dumb rules during my four-year undergrad uh, there. I just graduated last year and I'm in grad school at a normal, normal university now. Hit me up if you ever want to know more about that crazy place. By the way, I didn't actually hate all my time there and I do feel like I got a solid education, but the rules and other things about the school were insane. Dude, that, I love that one of the listeners is, is went to Bob Jones University. Uh, thank you so much, Marcus. And I actually met somebody at a show the other night who told me about Bob Jones University. They knew somebody who got kicked out for watching a Pixar movie. I think it was the one up. I think it was the, about the house that goes up, but it was like, it was PG, whatever. I can't remember the exact movie, unfortunately, but I remember it was a Pixar cartoon movie and they got caught watching and they got tossed. Uh, amazing updates. Thank you. Time suckers. Thanks time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Well, thanks again for listening, suckers. And once again, I uh, hope today didn't come across as too sacrilegious or blasphemous uh, for some of you. Uh, loving my religious suckers more and more all the time. Your tolerance of my heathen ass warms my heart. Hope all you suckers, all you meat sacks of every race and creed and look and gender have a fantastic week. And more than anything, I hope you keep on sucking.